This next talk is going to be transfer learning, analyst sourcing for behavioral classification, and it's going to be given by Tim Mather and Ignacio Arnaldo right here. A couple notes before we begin. If you guys have phones, please use them silently. Make sure that it's not going to disrupt everyone else and go after in the talk. Um, microphone for questions. If there's time for questions later, there's a microphone in the middle of the room, and we'd like to ask that for the sake of future viewers of this talk, which will be recorded and then posted on YouTube later if you want to go back and listen to it again, if you can just use the microphone, then your questions will be recorded also, which is much appreciated. Um, quickly, I'd like to thank all the sponsors, especially Verisprite, Protivity, Tenable, Amazon, Source of Knowledge. Without them, this event wouldn't be possible. Also, a big thank you to speakers, other sponsors, and all the volunteers. If you guys have feedback on the talk that you'd like to give, you can just go online, sagd.org, and there should be a form there that you can just fill out, and that's really appreciated also. So without further ado, presenters. Um, I'm Tim Matter. Can you hear me? Yes. So a little bit about myself. My background is in data science and AI, as Tim was saying. I studied back in Spain in Madrid, computer science, and then I did a PhD in AI. And then I moved to MIT where I was a postdoc, and we were basically building systems for machine learning at scale. So out of that, after that, I jumped into PatternX. It's a startup that is tackling cybersecurity problems, and we're actually using these techniques to solve some of these, to detect some of these attacks. Okay, so just to set a baseline here of what we're trying to do, and then he's going to get into the details of how we're trying to do that. You're all familiar with the kill chain. And of course, you want to get that interrupted as far left as possible. The farther right you go, of course, that's trouble. The problem with that is that today, the products that are available to you, the false positives are way too high. Of course, the false negatives are way too high, hence the number of breaches that we have. And you have, therefore, a very high demand for investigators, SOC analysts, to go handle all of this work. And if any of you have ever been a SOC analyst, you know it's frankly a pretty boring job. Most of them probably last about a year and say, that's enough. I'd like to go do something that's a little bit more interesting. So this is the problem we're trying to tackle here right now. And we're trying to do that across multiple phases of the kill chain. And again, of course, as far left, as early as possible. For example, delivery, that's great. Let's see if we can intercede it from even getting in to our organization. But we all know that it is going to get in. And so can we at least stop it, either command and control as an example, or exfiltration before the intellectual property the whatever it is that's important to your organization has walked out the door and you look at it and say, oh shit, there it goes, okay. Too late at that point. But you'd at least like to be able to, to do that, detect it if you can, and block it uh, as early as possible. The problem is, is that you're trying to look at all of these connections that are being logged. Okay, that may be internal, that may be external, it's at the various apps, it's at the network level, whatever it is. And those combinations of source IP address, destination IP address, ports, et cetera, that's billions and billions, maybe even depending upon the size of your organization, trillions of combinations per day. Okay. Let's be honest. There's no way a human is going to be able to go through that. Okay. I've been on the other side space myself. I know your pain. Okay. I would bet, bet you that you're not even logging 40% of the data that's available to you, and the amount of data that you're actually reviewing in near real time probably only about 10% of your enterprise. Okay? With numbers like that, there's no way that you're going to be able to find these types of attacks. So it's no wonder that we're missing over 80% of the attacks. And if you look at Verizon's data breach report, in spite of missing that number of attacks, when they are discovered, which is usually by a third party, not by the own organization, according to them, 82% of the time, the evidence is already right there. It's already in your log files. You've missed it. Okay? Because the volumes are too high, you don't have enough trained analysts to do this. So what Nacho is going to get into is that it's how do we train a model that I don't have to write SIM correlations for. Okay? Correlations are great, but the fact of the matter is I'm a big believer of Splunk. I used to be at Splunk. Okay? It's a great product. However, trying to write correlations for all of the thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of variables that you would have to account for isn't going to make it. Now, you can do wild carding. You can do various other tricks that Splunk enables, and that's great. But you're never going to write enough correlation rules to be able to do that. So Nacho, please, some of the challenges and how we're addressing those. Absolutely. So before, there have been like a few presentations of people explaining different use cases for security. 
and how they were using machine learning models, right? So uh, I want to say that, I mean, for me, like there's a few challenges that are basically, say, uh, blocking to apply AI in InfoSec, and I wanted to very briefly. Okay. So I wanted to very briefly go through those, right? And again, I'm gonna do the comparison with computer vision, like a lot of the previous speakers have done that, and the reason is that we've all seen the success in computer vision and how cars are self-driven and there's tons of apps that you throw a picture and you get tons of information back, right? So why is that kind of stuff not happening in InfoSec? Right? So for me, the first reason is that data is not readily available. So you can have access to malware samples, you can have access to bad domains, but how do you get any access to any lateral movement data set to say something, right? That doesn't even exist. The, also, organizations are, are siloed, so they're not sharing their information, their data, so it, it becomes very difficult to truly understand those attacks. As opposed to computer vision, where you can just go to Google, to YouTube, to anything, and get millions or billions of images. Another problem is that the data is not universal. And what I mean by that is that images are images, right? So you can take an image, put it in the right format, and it will be valid for your model. But in InfoSec, what we're facing is tons of devices generating information. There are different vendors for each type of device. You have different vendors for firewalls and so on. So each will generate a slightly different data. And then there are versions. So if you take that and get the, the, combi the combinatorics, you will find that there is hundreds of different data sources that you need to understand how to, how to ingest. Uh, again, in computer vision, face recognition is face recognition here in Spain, where I'm from, and, and everywhere in the world, right? Same for self-driven cars. And now, one of the biggest challenges that I face on my day-to-day -day basis is that the data is not labeled. So they tell me, you need to go here, take this data source, and detect this attack. And I say, well, show me some examples. Nobody can do that. I mean, nobody is telling me, okay, this is what an, an example looks like. And the reason is that very few people, actually you guys can understand what is, what is an attack and what is not, right? Whereas for computer vision, like researchers have built like data sets with billions of, of examples for, because labeling is very easy, right? So anyone, so anyone can go and, and say whether in an image there's a cat or a dog and that would be a labeled example that the machine learning model can ingest and learn to recognize. Another, yet another problem is that the data is very dynamic. So an attack that is valid today might change in six months, right? So the data, you combine the fact that there are few labels, few people that can give labels, and that the labels have an expiration date, so the examples have an expiration date, and it becomes very difficult to create data sets good enough to train accurate machine learning models. So I just wanted to provide an overview of what my life is, has been in these past two years. So there's a lot of work into making these machine learning models work, right? So people have talked about the benefits of deep learning and how that can leverage some of that, to which I agree to some extent. But in my opinion, you need to either become a domain expert to understand those attacks and be able to detect those, or get in touch with, or work closely with domain experts such as Tim that can give me the information that I need, right? And what I need is to understand what the attacks look like. And there's a wide range of it, of those, not all of, the, all, all of them will be suitable for machine learning approaches. You need to identify w which ones you can actually tackle. Once you do that, you need to understand what are the data sources that you need to parse and model to detect those attacks. After that, you need to understand what are the right features. So what is the right, say, numeric number that will describe the activity of the attack? And finally, you need to understand how to model those features and that, that feature data. So that is, is a, it's a lot of work. And and I would say it's one of the biggest challenges because if you, com if you compare against computer vision, here there would only be just one data source, right? Images or videos, whereas we need to deal with hundreds. So one of the things that we see that can definitely improve this situation is to engage a, a human analyst, a domain expert, where the AI itself is engaging the expert, right? So basically, the idea is to create the loop, and this is not new, this is active learning, this is again machine learning, model, machine learning research from the 90s. So it's not a set of models, it's rather a protocol where you have an AI system that wants to train a model, right? And the AI itself would query an analyst and would say, well, you domain expert, uh, I know you have a very limited bandwidth, so let me show you like 100 examples, give me labels for those, so annotate those, tell me whether they're attacks or not, and I will learn from it, right? And basically that's what happens here. So you have some smart logic to understand what to query to the analyst. So the idea is that not only you want to show attacks, you want to show things that would make the model better. So basically things that whenever the analyst labels, the model gets better. So then 
once the analyst has given the labels, you train a new classifier, and, it, and that classifier then can be deployed, right? So I'm not going to go into the deployment phase in this talk. It's all about training the models. Okay. So you could argue that, okay, now we have a system that can take the knowledge from one analyst, get his feedback, and improve models, right? Where the AI itself is going to be querying the analyst. So then once we have that, that framework in, in place, the idea would be why not communicate across different organizations, right? Since if people are, like analysts are already providing those labels that are needed for machine learning model, but they can only provide things, labels for things that they see at their environment, right? So what if we can put together different organizations and share the label data so that machine learning models that, machine learning models that we try become more accurate? Now, the goal for doing this is, of course, in machine learning, it's well known that the more labeled examples you have, the better your models will become. So if we, if we share labeled data across organizations, what we would expect to see is better detection rates at the end of it. You're learning from more examples, the odds are you'll be, you'll be de detecting more things. At the same time, because we're going to get labels or label data at a higher pace, we expect to learn faster. So whenever a new attack happens, you don't have to wait to have 100 instances at your organization, because if you get those instances from everybody, then you can train an accurate model faster. At the same time, if, say, you can expect to see, to detect attacks that you have never seen before, but that someone else has. Someone else has. Why? Because if somebody detects an attack, gives you the label information, he can give you that, you can train a model that would expect that kind of behavior in the future. So translated into like a, a detection performance plot, uh, over time, what we would expect to see is that the, the curve that uses transfer learning, so basically that is getting data from everyone, would end up having a better detection rate. It would also learn faster, so it will have a higher slope, and it won't start at zero. Because in, eventually you can have examples of attacks happening at, an, at, a third, I mean at another organization other than yours. So there's two ways to carry out transfer learning that, has, that are popular in the literature. So one is you can directly share the models. So those are executable black boxes that take data in, generate predictions out, as in, is it an attack or not? Or you can share the label data. And we're going to go through the, to, with the second and we're going to explain why. So here, going back to what Tim was saying, where people have already been sharing information, right, and, and doing transfer learning to some extent, I would say that today what is happening is that when you, when you subscribe to a TI feed or are contributing in a, in a community-oriented threat intelligence uh, feed, what's happening is you're sharing those exact, say, in, the case, in this case, domains that are bad, right? So anyone that has, is, is analyzing his own data can grab for these domains and whatever happens to be a match, he will say, well, maybe I need to investigate this thing, right? Sorry. So what we're proposing here is that what we actually should do to extend that to be able to apply machine learning models is that not only you need to share the IOCs, but you need to share the features that describe the activity of those models. So I'm going to go through a specific example of how we do that in, later on. So in order to implement this and to get this going, you need some infrastructure. And so basically you need every organization that is having this label acquisition loop where the analysis is being engaged and providing label data. You need to connect all of them and build a central repository, right? So just like everybody today is sharing the IOCs, we want to, we, we, we want to create an, an equivalent thing where people are sharing not only the IOCs, but also that features that describe the behavior of those IOCs. So there are many options to, to do this. Basically, if you're familiar with uh, threat intelligence, there's a format that is widely used that is stick. So it's basically JSON. You can put in there like uh, any, any fields you want, and these are actually already exist, right? So entity, or actually I added, I added entity. Then you have the ID, the created time, the modified time, the name. In this case, will be a specific domain that we identified as, as malicious. Then the description. In this case, we would have to add the label, which is delivery. And then the features, right? So if you just want to share that stuff, the IOC together with the features, just need to append the field and propagate that through the network. And in order to, to consolidate the distribution, there's a, an open source framework that is Taxi that can be definitely extended to, that, that is used to propagate those uh, thread intel feeds in sticks format. So the, the tools are, are already there. Now, there's one big problem though, is that, and this is the, probably the most, uh, I would say, technical part of the talk, is that 
who's to say that an attack at or, and an organization A is also uh, an attack at an organiza organization B? Because companies might have different policies. Maybe what a company considers malicious, another company says, well, it's okay for me. I don't care about it, or uh, it, it's perfectly normal. That will depend on the organizations. So we cannot just blindly take data from the outside. We need to do some level of curation of the, of the examples that we're getting. For that, uh, this is one suggestion. This is open, this is work in progress. It's not like uh, anybody has fully understood how to do this. But one idea is to say, given that you will have some local examples of what an attack looks like, right? You can fetch, say we're the local organization. We can fetch the examples. In this case, we'll, we'll be flagging with red the attacks, with green the benign examples. And, and with uh, white, it will be something for which we don't have a label. And this is the representation that we'll see throughout in machine learning oriented pro problems, where you have rows, these are different entities. This could be domain one, domain two, domain three, domain four, domain five. And these are features that describe the domain. So this could be the domain length, this could be uh, the ratio of digits to consonants and so on. So what you're gonna, what you're gonna be doing is you have a set of uh, attacks or bad domains that you have identified at your organization, this particular case, you're gonna get fetch uh, bad domains that were, that were identified by an analyst at not another organization, and you're gonna do some magic here to understand whether those extra examples are helping you or not, right? So that's where you need to apply some logic to curate. Basically the goal is to say, do I use the attack examples from a third organization for learning or not, right? So that can be tested via, say, some kind of A-B test via cross-validation, which means you try with the external examples and without the external examples. Whatever works best, you do, okay? And at the end of it, once you have understood whether you need to use the, the attack examples from other organizations, you build your training set that has uh, the, the benign and the attacks, and then you can train your standard machine learning model that can be used to detect further future instances of the attack. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you talking about the last question. Can I not do diet, I didn't ask for anything. Yeah, Somebody put in under outrageous speaker requests when they filled out the CFP that they wanted to answer diet Mountain Dew. Okay. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 Now that they're there, I'll get one, so. <laughs> so now I want to use the, the remaining of the talk to provide like a, an example of how to apply this technology, right? So this is an example, and people have already talked about URL analysis. In my opinion, it's, it's a good fit for a talk because it's intuitive, and it's a good fit for machine learning model as well. And I'm, try to, I'm gonna try to motivate that, right? So this is a domain that we found uh, in one of the organization's data that we have access to. And well, virus total reported it as, as malicious, and if you can see the timestamp, that was only yesterday, and we actually discovered some time ago, right? And let me try to explain why we can actually detect these things, right? I mean, it's quite simple when you think of it. So first of all, the domain looks fishy, right? So you have like somebody telling you to click here and, and update something, probably not good. But you know what, like if, if you want to detect those with current TI feeds, you're gonna be looking at the exact domain. So what happened if the attacker actually all he changes the top level domain? Say that the, the domain is exactly the same, there's a top level domain changes. So that might not be stopped by those blacklists, right? Now say that for some reason you manage to block those three, you understand that those, sorry, you understand that those three are bad and update your blacklist. What is the bad guy gonna do next? Well, he's gonna just modify it a bit and Sure, sure enough, it's gonna bypass the defenses, right? So I can keep going, and, and these are things that we saw in a very short period of time, but as you can see, it's very tricky to keep up with this, uh, with these small variations, right? So blacklist won't do it. On the other side, everybody can see a pattern, right? So here you have like domains that are very similar in length, have similar words, uh, have weird top-level domains. So this is a good fit for machine learning. So I'm gonna do a quick experiment. So we're gonna be analyzing data from three different organizations over six months. So data spanning from January to June 2000, 2017. And we're gonna be considering traffic to the top uh, 10K Alexa domains, which we will consider benign. And, we, and we're gonna be using some thousand phishing attempts that we identified, out of which, uh, I mean, but there were only 488 unique domains, which means that some of the domains actually showed up twice. 
So this is how we're gonna be doing it, how we're gonna be trying to detect these bad domains. And this is very simple, but it's for the purpose of the talk. So basically we're gonna list all the domains that we see, and for each of the domains, as was explained in the previous talks, exactly the same, we're gonna be extracting, extracting a set of features, right? So for Google dot Yes, Spain, you will have the vowel ratio, digit ratio, the number of phishing names, uh, other characters ratio, the frequency of the top level domain as a, as a proxy to know how trust, how the reputation of the top level domain. That's something that we identified that people are registering domains in very cheap top level domains that don't have all the checks. And then the domain length and the consonant ratio. So very simple. I mean, let's not expect to detect everything with this, but just for the purpose of the, of the experiment. And at the end of it, we append the label, whether it was a benign domain or a delivery domain, right? So in order to train a model, we're gonna be choosing random forests. So other people have talked about neural networks. In my opinion, random forests are a very good fit for infosec use cases, because you do, you are in a situation where you have a lot of benign examples and very few attack examples, right? So in those kind of cases where you have unlabeled data, those models are a very good fit. And they provide some level of interpretability as well. So once they generate a prediction, we can dig into the model to understand why he predicted that domain, a domain to be good or bad. Then when it comes to choosing your machine learning library, you can you have a myriad of choices. I use Scikit-learn, which is a library I use a lot, has proven me that it's very robust in production environments. So I highly recommend it. So this is a first organization, not talking to anyone, just improving over time, right? So what we're seeing here is that the six months, and here we're showing the detection, re the recall at 100, which means we're showing the analyst the top 100 domains that we identify, and we're seeing how many attacks, the percentage of attacks that we're caching, that, that, we're, that we're detecting. Which means, for example, at the second month, if you look at the top 100 attacks, you're only catching 30%. At the third month, as you have the examples from the previous months, your, your detection gets better, right? So that's the human in the loop that is training uh, the platform over time. So what is happening actually is that the model is getting updated every month, and as a, as a result, the detection rate is roughly going up. Now we do the same thing at the second organization, and we see that roughly there's an upward trend. We get a hit here. I'm not exactly sure of, of why, haven't, haven't checked, but most likely the domains that, ha that showed up in the six months were very different from the domains that were identified before. Therefore, it, the, the classifier was not good at detecting those patterns. And now what we're showing here is what happens if, if those two organizations had shared their labeled attacks, right? If they could have created a common repository of attacks and learned together. So what we see is that we see a higher slope for the blue one, very small one, so there's a minor improvement for the organization two. But for organization one, we see that from the second month, we're actually going from 0 0.3 roughly to 0 0.7, right? So that's a very significant improvement. By sharing their attack examples, they can actually improve those models much faster. So now what happens is if a third organization joins this network, say five months in, right? As these guys have already been sharing information, a new guy comes and joins the network, right? So what, what, what actually happens in this case is that the, the guy that is the organization three that is joining the network at the fifth month is not starting at zero, as these guys did, but it's actually starting at 0 0.5. So even if you no, have not detected any, any attack at your organization, just by getting the data from the others, you could actually be detecting 50% of, of those attacks. And this is an, a small comparison that we did as to when we were finding these bad domains and when they were being reported in blacklist. And without too many details, we saw that uh, the median time uh, of us detecting those was like 10 weeks before. Roughly because of uh, because those uh, those domains have like a very clear pattern and were easy to spot by these classifiers, right? Whereas for a human, it takes a human to actually examine the domain, analyze it, see whether it's good or bad, and then upload it to and then update one of those lists. Now I wanted to provide some hints as to what uh, each of you can do at your organization to try to start deploying these solutions, right? So the first thing is that. I recommend the URL analysis. It's a, it's, a, it's a nice use case. We have seen it in the other talks. It will yield results. And one step that would have to be taken to improve this is to, to expand the features that we're using, right? So when I said that this model provides some visibility or some interpret interpretability, we can see here which features are important, right? So we're seeing that domain length seems to be important. The number of phishing names is important, so that's uh, to be expected, basically, it's whether the domain contains keywords as update, upgrade, download, now, free, safe, that kind of stuff. And then the others, well, not, not so important, right? But the idea is that 
you analysts will have ideas of what to look for, right? So you need to translate those into features. And once you have those features, you can actually train a model that will be more accurate. Another way to apply these technologies at your organization is to target all the use cases. So that you need to follow a standard data science process. The first step is to identify the use cases you want to solve, right? There could be use cases unique to your organization. Nobody else has solved those. You need to identify what the problem is. Now, here we provide some hints, right? So delivery via efficient domains or via DJs, those are use cases that can be addressed easily. Um, but then you need to understand where the attack will get logged, right? So if there's any particular data source that is useful to, to your uh, use case, you need to fetch it, you need to be able to understand it and process it. Then you need to get attack examples. And, and then you need to loop through a, a cycle, which is where the data science work is, of identifying appropriate features. So what are the right numerical values that would describe those attacks? and then train and validate a model. So you extract some features, train a model, see how good the model is. If the model is not good enough, you need to cycle back and get new, more better features, right? So that's the data science job. And then once you have a model that you trust, you need to understand whether you want to deploy it online or batch. If it's batch, it means that maybe your organization only cares at looking at the logs every month or so. So you can do it like uh, retrospectively, and that's all good. If you want to do it online, then it's another story. It requires some systems and some productionize. I mean, you need to productionize those models. It's more involved, but it can definitely be done. And then finally, you need to find your peers here in this conference and understand which ones will be willing to share those uh, feature, those labeled attacks with the features, and try to build your network. So that was. So actually, I have a question for the audience. Then. Uh, are we are we out of time? Or? We have time for a couple questions. Okay. So how many of you participate in ISACs or other uh, sharing information? Not a high percentage, a few of you, but okay, okay. And, and as Josh mentioned, most of that sharing then is probably using Stitch Taxi, but there's no then really uh, automated analysis of that data. It gets aggregated, but how do you compare that against your peers? And that's what we're talking about here is a way to do that. So with that said, welcome any questions from the floor. The microphone is ready for the volunteer. Uh, the, the use case, uh, one of the use cases you have mentioned is C2. There's a, there's a switch on this. Actually, why, why don't we pause for just like 30 seconds. If anyone would like to leave, go ahead. Otherwise, we'll stay here during the break and answer your questions. So one of the use cases uh, you have mentioned is C2 weakening. Um, the C2 use case, yeah. where where uh, you know you can track C2 through proxy, right? You can do some machine learning on proxy logs, and and detect C2 weakening. Correct. So the question is, if I have to share information on proxy logs, mm -hmm. so that I have more data to train the model on, do I have to, as an organization, share all my proxy logs, or only the ones where, where there is, there was a red team event of C2 or... It's entirely up to you. And the other thing to point out, as not just said, is that you're, what you're sharing with us is one thing for analysis. What gets shared through the transfer model are features. It's not a problem that the ISACs have where you have to basically scrub the data and make sure there's nothing sensitive in there, whether that's your IP addresses or other, perhaps usernames, anything like host names, whatever like that. So just to provide some context, you will be sharing the feature data? Yeah which could be contain things in that use case like number of connections, uh, periodicity of the connections to that domain, right? Or number of bytes sent in each connection, that kind of thing. So, so the sharing has to be in the context of a machine learning model. It's not that I'm sharing raw mm -hmm. logs. You no. know, I'll have to keep a machine learning model in mind and accordingly share labeled data. It's analyzed data. Yeah. yeah, okay. It's analyzed data that is not containing, again, sensitive information. There's not IP addresses in there. There's not perhaps usernames, there's not perhaps host names. It's features. It's features that have been modeled for your organization. This is a particular type of behavior that we see. Mm -hmm. And that's what's being shared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, the, my, my question would be, uh, you would have to have a standardization on the type of machine learning algorithm you're going to use. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it depends. That doesn't so. seem obvious to me. Uh, you could argue that feature engineering is some, somewhat coupled with the model that you deploy. Uh, in this case, uh, yeah, you, you can standardize on random forest, it will work just fine. In my opinion, if you have the right features and enough data, it will just work. But that being said, 
once you receive all the features from all the others in your own, and you have your own features, at that point you can also try different models. Yeah. I had a question. Uh, yeah. So how uh, sensitive are your algorithms to uh, uh, label data that is not right? So you have- That is correct. So that's, um, I don't know if, in one of the slides, we were showing a cross-validation loop with, uh, say, A-B testing. We were taking the data from the outside, understanding whether it was helping, and then whether deciding to keep it or reject it, right? So I think that's the idea that we need to, we need to apply here. We need to have some level of curation of those, of those examples. So before training the model, you first understand whether that data is useful for you, and if it's not, you just reject it. So do you, don't, you don't apply a second layer of algorithms to sort of figure out whether you have good label data or bad label data or, or anything like that? We do, we do. So as part of that receiving process, eh, there is all that kind of lo all that logic that curates the data that is coming from the outside. And that curation means you are training models, understanding how they're behaving and so on. Um, just a question about the, the training data sample mm -hmm. that you're using for the cross-validation. How do you ensure that's a like rep representative sample to compare against? Yeah, so what, I mean, for me the way to do it, if I have my own organization, would be I get all the data from my organization. So I get the data from my organization and use that as benign examples, right? And then you take the data of the attacks and use those as malicious. And that way you make sure that the data is representative because you're using your own data. So it's exactly what it's gonna be looking like tomorrow, right, when you deploy them. Uh, no, that's probably hardly feasible. Uh, so roughly in these cases, I would account just for say weekdays and weekends. So maybe a week, couple of weeks, three weeks, four weeks, that range. I was wondering if there's any uh, successful use cases you could share. I find, like the URL is a great example, but I find many of the problems in security are, the attacks are far more subtle in terms of detecting, uh, you know, it's the combination of legitimate activity in certain combinations often uh, result in the actual malicious activity occurring. So. Um, that is correct. I think, uh, as I was saying, that was my, my, my last two years was exactly that, right? It was identifying what are the right use cases for this technology and how we can address those. So as part of that modeling decision, you need to understand what those attacks look like, right? So you need to know what to look for. You need to understand what is the right entity, which means do you want to have a, a classifier based on domains, or is it gonna be source IP? Or are you gonna even be more granular and say, I just want to model individually like every pair of source IP and domain, for example. So that will give you, even though that source IP might be doing a lot of legitimate things, if you assume that the domain is bad, those connections will all be bad, right? So that's, that's part of the modeling decision. And then once you understand that, you need to understand what are the right features, right? And iterate in that space. That, that's just for delivery. I mean, what, we, what we're trying to do is detect attacks at different stages of the kill chain across that. So you may miss it at delivery, and maybe you catch it at lateral movement, or maybe you catch it at command and control, mm -hmm. whatever it is. So we're trying to do that at multiple stages of the kill chain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, you have to think of lateral movement is very difficult to detect sometimes, though, and the difference between legitimate and malicious is very subtle. Yeah. Exactly, so in, I, I fully agree. So for example, in those cases, uh, they, that's a, for me para, like a clear example of the challenges. So where, where can I find a data set to play with that, right? Like nowhere. Like where, where can I find like what an attack looks like? Nowhere, right? So that's, that's PowerShell and then the extreme difficulty of trying to log that activity yeah. thanks to Microsoft makes that very, very difficult to detect. You need something on the endpoint that's gonna detect that because you're not gonna see it yeah. uh, otherwise. I've been working with new Microsoft PowerShell logging now. Script black logging is very robust, so, but it is. Mm. It is. It is when you turn it on and you get everything deployed on every single endpoint, but, yeah. but that's a huge chore to itself. So that's, uh, that's, that's one of the cases where you see like all the, all the talks about deep learning and so on, and they're trying to go from the 90% to the 99%, right? To 95 to the 99.99. And that's a case where we need, we need to go from zero to 60, right? And that's, that's, that requires a set of, different set of technology, I think. Hi, so as uh, someone who's new to AI but has experience in security, let's say you sold me on this, I want to bring it back to my boss and say this is a great thing, we should implement this, we'll work with, well with our partners, we're willing to share. 
What's the next step? What do I need to do to implement this? Okay. So I think it will depend a lot on the use case you want to target. Because some of use cases will be very lightweight on the infrastructure side. Say you want to do some domain analysis. You can get your logs and dump the domains or take those from wherever it's simple. That you can do very easily. So that will require you like a few scripts that extract those features and train the machine learning models. There have been tutorials in the previous presentations. That won't be like more than 100 lines of code, right? Now, if you want to do that on other use cases, that would require you to look at long time windows of time. You won't say detect command and control over, over uh, behaviors over a month or over two months. That means that you need to a whole big data infrastructure to process those logs, to extract the right behaviors looking at a lot of data, and that becomes a big data problem. So that's when it gets difficult, I think. So I think perhaps more to the security aspect of that, again, as Nacho said, it depends upon the use case that you want to try and address and pick which one is most acute for you. And that is going to drive what data sources do you need to effectively turn over so that those data sources can be analyzed. And then on top of the data sources, are you actually logging the data elements that would be needed to detect whatever that is that you're trying, whatever your use case is? So it's, it's a multi step process. It can be done very definitely. But there's a security component to it, and there's the AI component to it. Yeah, I, I, would, I would look at it at that in two different uh, axes. One is the size or the volume of the logs you need to pass. And the second is whether you need batch uh, analysis or real-time analysis. Depending on those, on those two factors, the requirements will be completely different. And, and the, the work that is involved to make this thing work. 